Russia and Ukraine's war is raging on. This morning, drone strikes rained on both Moscow and Kiev, coming as an aerial assault on Ukraine's capital left at least one person dead. But as the war increasingly heats up, elites are saying the quiet part out loud. Here's USA director Samantha Powers displaying her dismay at the unprecedented amount of aid the U.S. is sending to Ukraine. Let's watch. One of the things that Congress has given USAID uh, since this full-scale invasion began is an unprecedented amount of money mm -hmm. in direct budget support, which sounds kind of obvious. Of course, we would do that. We want to stand with Ukraine, but it's totally unprecedented, these, this kind of scale of investment. And we're talking in, along the lines of about $15 billion in, in a sense, cash to mm -hmm. the Ukrainian government, mm -hmm. which was famously corrupt, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in past years and still has work, as you noted, to do on corruption today. I don't know if we could have gotten that money out of Congress, if not for DIA. Mm -hmm. Because what DIA allows us to do is that direct budget support goes, yes, to the Ukrainian government, but then it goes to pay teachers, to pay healthcare workers, to pay first responders. And there's a digital trail. It's not, you know, some official deciding this or that. It actually is going directly into the bank accounts in a manner that just, it would have been untraceable in a, in a, in a prior regime. So Editor of the Gray Zone News, Max Blumenthal, is here to weigh in. Welcome, Max. Good to see you both. So you hear Samantha Powers there explaining that Ukraine is corrupt. It is known to be one of the most corrupt countries uh, in Europe, in the world, that but for DIA, there would be a lot of difficulty getting these cash transfers to from the United States to Ukraine because of reasonable fears of corruption. But then she characterizes it as a good thing that DIA uh, enables this workaround. Ex unpack this for us. What is DIA and why should we be concerned here? There are two points I want to make here. First is that Samantha Power is talking about aid directly from the American taxpayer to pay for Ukrainian teachers, healthcare workers, and public workers. That's after Joe Biden had denied paying for Ukrainian pensions. And this is all taking place as inflation hits the American worker. And you recently saw teachers in the LA United School District strike so they could have better wages. But meanwhile, billions are being paid directly through a shady experimental app to Ukrainian teachers. So how will this affect the American voting population to hear that their money is being stripped out of their pockets to pay Ukrainian salaries? We also saw Lindsey Graham, the biggest hawk in Congress, declare in a meeting with Vladimir Zelensky that the Ukraine war has been a good investment because we've killed a lot of Russians. So we were told all along that this was just about supplying military aid so that the U.S. could liberate Ukraine from an unprovoked Russian invasion. Now we see it's about paying Ukrainian workers and simply about throwing Ukrainian soldiers, the young, the youth of Ukraine, into a slaughterhouse to kill lots of Russians. That's not what Americans, how Americans were sold on this war. And just on that app, really quickly, what I witnessed at this event overseen by USAID Director Samantha Power was straight up war profiteering, using the ravages of Ukraine to devise a so-called state in a smartphone that provides digital ID and government services electronically to Ukrainians, and then using that to Ukraine as a laboratory to export that to other countries where citizens have very little power, such as Zambia and Colombia and Zanzibar. Uh, <laughs> that's, another that's another purpose of this war, laboratory Ukraine. Let's play an encounter that uh, you had, Max, with Ukraine's ambassador to the U.S., Oksana Markarova. Uh, let's watch this. This event was about profiting off of war, turning Ukraine into a laboratory, Are you the wrong? ruins of Ukraine into a laboratory for the fourth industrial revolution. You are absolutely um, getting wrong. Getting Ukrainians Ukraine? all in a digital. No, you are not interested in the, in yeah, the yeah, answer. Please. And can you tell me why my my colleague Anya Parko was on a kill list? Your interior ministry maintains a kill list of journalists, and my partner here, Anya Parnfield, is on it. Unlike uh, in Ukraine, you can't kill and ban your opposition here. Our Nazis actually have to hide behind the government, not serve in the government. Looks like you were having a really enjoyable evening. Uh, what was going on there, Max? <laughs> 
Well, uh, me and my very close colleague at the Gray Zone, Anya Parampil, were trying to be the two only reporters at this event because there were not any reporters asking any critical questions. Kara Swisher, who probably was paid a handsome fee, was on stage conducting softball interviews with uh, people who are in, directly engaged in a war, in a hot war. And so we, I questioned the Ukrainian ambassador to DC about this event being an exercise in war profiteering, number one. And then I wanted to ask her about the inclusion of Anya and my colleague Aaron Mate, as well as uh, recently added nightclub comedian Jimmy Dore to the Ukrainian government's kill list. This is a kill list known as Mirotvoretz or Peacemaker that has seen hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of Ukrainian citizens, Russians, even children, and American citizens, including everyone from Henry Kissinger to Roger Waters, placed on a kind of blacklist. And several of the people who've appeared on this list, including the Ukrainian journalist Oles Buzina, have been assassinated by death squads in the streets of Ukraine. Daria Dugina, the uh, daughter of the Russian nationalist philosopher, was killed in a car bomb by Ukrainian intelligence services outside Moscow. Her name was marked liquidated on that list. So I wanted to ask the Ukrainian ambassador about this list that my colleagues are on, American journalists are on. And she she walked away. I was trying to give her a chance to respond, but she walked away. And that's been the Ukrainian government's response so far. We've heard nothing from so-called press freedom NGOs, however. Mm. Max, your reporting in this context and elsewhere really is unique and I think valuable to a lot of our listeners. I want to make sure that Thank we you. really understand what's going on with this DIA app, though, in particular. Uh, I'm reading at The Guardian that it's an app that's installed on 70 percent of all smartphones. I know that you did a Twitter thread yesterday that got a lot of traction that explained some of the surveillance impl implications of this app uh, being so... Uh, widely installed. What What is it supposed to do? What is the stated goal of the app? And what are your concerns about what it might ultimately be used for? Well, just imagine as an American citizen or a citizen of any uh, purported liberal democracy in the West, if you're watching this right now, if your entire state, your interaction with government took place in a smartphone, uh, this is, you're living, you're literally living in a digital prison. Uh, this and, and imagine that your state is using central bank digital currency and can cut off funds to you, as it as we saw the Canadian government do uh, against supporters of the Canadian truckers protesting vaccine mandates in Ottawa. This app is for export. It's using Ukraine as a laboratory to accelerate this process. And so far in Ukraine, it's been used to do everything from paying incentives to get people to take the jab uh, to having them register their vaccination status, to having them um, apply for reconstruction of their homes damaged in the war, to being able to report on their neighbors who they suspect of being Russian collaborators. And we've seen video after video of accused Russian collaborators who are Ukrainian citizens be killed and thrown in ditches by neo-Nazi forces attached to the Ukrainian military. This was advertised at this event overseen by the USAID director, that it's a snitching app. So I find that highly disturbing. It's an app being tested in a country where the entire political opposition has been banned, where all opposition media has been banned, and where politicians, activists, and average citizens are being arrested, disappeared, and even killed for having a different opinion. And just to steel man this a little bit, some people might say, well, any new emerging technology can be used to do all the bad things that we can currently do under an existing technology. If you want to snitch, you can call, you can email, you can inform on your colleagues or friends. People do that already. Um, and that as long as alternative mo modes of payment, cash, credit cards, et cetera, or alternative modes of filing your taxes, which is something that you can do on this app, alternative modes that are pre-existing continue to exist, that there are upsides to having apps like these because of convenience, and that the downsides are not um, endemic to the app itself. What do you say to people who might think of this as just another kind of um, uh, panic around a new technology, the likes of which we've seen since the invention of uh, fire? Well. I guess they didn't live through the pandemic where a, a large slice of society was temporary, temporarily frozen out of public participation 
through the paper vaccine passport, which if digitized would simply make them make it impossible for them to travel. That was all being tested in Eastern Europe, the digital vaccine passport, digital ID. But we also have to consider geolocation. These, I, I highly doubt that the DIA app is just being used to allow the good guys in Ukraine to snitch on the bad guys. It's also, it could also be used to track young men who do not want to be conscripted and sent to the front lines to die in a slaughterhouse like Bakhmut. And we've seen video after video filmed by average Ukrainians of men of military age being rounded up and thrown into vans by military police to be taken to the front to fight and die. Uh, this, so, so essentially what you're looking at, if your entire interaction with your government and with society takes place through a smartphone when your government is using central bank digital currency, not blockchain, you are living in a digital prison. Hmm. You know, it's interesting uh, in that it, you allude to the, you know, the corruption and the, the experimentation going on in Europe. And even in that clip we played of Samantha Power, she kind of she, she does nod to, well, you, you know, Ukraine was a corrupt government. It didn't stop suddenly being corrupt, even though we're giving it, you know, all this all this money. Um, why, why does that prompt no self-reflection among <laughs> U.S. officials, elites, you know, the people who still support what's going on in Ukraine and, and supported Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, all down the line, that, uh, yeah, these are corrupt governments, they get our money, and then, we, you know, we end up empowering sometimes groups that we don't have control over. Sometimes people end up with weapons that we didn't want them to get. Um, but And there's no, oops, I guess we'll just do it again. It's amazing. Samantha Power was sitting right next to Mikhailo Fedorov, who is the first head of the Ministry of Digital Transformation, which was created by Zelensky in 2019 to advance this Davos-centric fourth industrial revolution. Fedorov presided over Ukraine's partnership with FTF, FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried's uh, CryptoCon, and $60 million at least flowed from FTX investors into Ukraine through the Ministry of Digital Transformation. And we have no idea where that money went. FTX investors, look like it looks like they were hosed and it was laundered in Ukraine. I mean, who knows where it went? But Samantha Power sitting there saying, well, we were able to get $15 billion out of Congress through this app presided over by the same ministry that partnered with FTX. And we know that it's going to the right places and the right people because it leaves a digital footprint. Where can we see the digital footprint of our, tra our tax dollars? We can't. Yeah, and I'm curious, Max, I, I know that a lot of this framing and framing that I've engaged in as well is that it's particularly unethical given the domestic problems that America is facing, homelessness crisis, um, you know, crime, uh, lack of medical uh, care, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that so much money is being very easily spent, it seems, abroad. I, but I wonder sometimes when people are making these arguments, it does strike me that there is a lack of an appetite for domestic spending both on both sides of the aisle, and we're seeing that a little bit in these debt ceiling negotiations. Are you ever concerned that this, I think, true and accurate argument that there is more appetite to spend money abroad than it is at, that there is at home is leading people to believe that there is a real appetite, even among anti-Ukraine war, anti-war advocates, to actually do more domestic spending to help working class Americans? Or is it just being used as an argument against Ukraine without any real interest in following through and delivering for working people here at home? I mean, just look at the debt negotiations and how the military budget was this sacred cow that could not be touched and how little pressure the Democrats, including the progressive Democrats, put on the Republicans to start stripping away at this now close to $900 billion military budget. Actually, uh, Winslow Wheeler, former head of the Government Accountability Office under George H.W. Bush, tabulates it at $1.5 trillion. That's if you include uh, inflation and veterans benefits. And the Republicans wouldn't touch this. They only want to touch social spending that goes to the poor and working people of America. Uh, so. Where and where does the military budget go? A CBS investigation, not exactly the most anti-war outlet, hmm. found that over half of it 
goes to government contractors who are overcharging the military, and yet Congress won't touch this. So of course we should be talking about domestic spending. It starts with domestic spending, and it's and and, and the the one of the major reasons that the U.S. is in Ukraine, and that at this event I went to in D.C. that negotiations and peace were not discussed once is because our economy runs on military Keynesianism. No offense to Keynes, but that's the best way I can characterize it. And what do you mean by that? That How so much of our economy depends on the military budget going to the Beltway bandits here in Washington, Deloitte, Booz Allen, Hamilton, Lockheed, Raytheon, and all their employees who are filling up all of these uh, luxury housing units that are being built while no new housing is being built for the poor and working class of D.C. Uh, it's also the same in Texas or Colorado. So much of the economy revolves around the military budget. And then there's the R&D, the research for to produce new weapons and new technology. That's what this country is. So much of this country's middle class, upper middle class and even upper class depends on. And to be in this war in Ukraine puts that economy on overdrive, just mm -hmm. as the Afghanistan war did as well. Max, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.